Or good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mia is joining us today, so it's a special treat for, for us to be able to worship together. Um, but let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into worship this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for just the privilege that we have to be able to gather together so freely and to be able to worship you. We pray that we would not take that for granted, that we would not take that lightly, but that we would desire to make the best use of our days here on the earth, that we would make the best use of our time in every day. And so we pray to that end this morning that we would be able to worship in spirit and in truth, that it would be more than just words on a page, more than just words that we sing, but Father, that we would sing these from our heart, that we would mean the things that we worship and praise you with, and that you would be exalted, honored, and glorified in this place. And so we ask and pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Despite whatever might happen in this life, Lord, that we would recognize your greatness, your awesome power, and your might. That we would learn to see the victories just in obedience, not in the outcomes, but just in true obedience and surrender unto you. We pray this morning that you would continue to work in our hearts, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would lead us in all truth. Father, that as we prepare to study your word this morning, that you would just give us your understanding 
that we would be able to rightly divide it and that we would make the practical application to our lives and help each one of us to leave this place today having drawn closer to you this morning. And so we thank you, we praise you, we commit ourselves in this time unto you, and we ask all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and everyone said, Amen. 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 You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, um, uh, Sue introduced me last week, but for those of you who are not here, my name is Marina Biddle. Um, I'm the drummer's wife, if anybody wants to. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, I taught um, in the evenings about five years ago, and then, you know, work got crazy and things like that. So um, so I am excited and so blessed, and I get emotional, by the way, so um, I'm already feeling it. Um, so I'm excited, and I'm really blessed to be able to teach you guys, and, um, and I'm just so happy to be able to. <laughs> um, so um, I love teaching God's Word. I'm sorry. Okay. So um, let's just start with prayer, and, uh, and let's get started. Um, Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you are with us, and that you love us, and that, um, and that we, we just have an opportunity, Lord, to draw close to you, and we just thank you, Lord, for, for just bringing us all together in, in your spirit, and um, we just pray, Lord God, that as we prepare to, to, um, to, to go over these verses, Father God, that you just speak to our hearts and that you give us your words, that you teach us, and that um, that you just uh, let us know, Lord, that that whatever whatever we're carrying, whatever is happening, Father God, that you are with us and we can just let it go. And right now, Lord God, just set our minds to calmness and help us, Lord, to just hear from you, hear your word, and just draw close to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So I titled this Forgive and Finish Strong. Um, and the title probably won't make sense until the end. So you want to uh, give the date and the sure. scripture at the beginning. Okay. Um, so today is April 18th, 2023. And this is lesson 22, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 16. Um, and so um, last time. Um, Sue taught and we learned about uh, Paul's exhortation to Timothy to be wary of false teachers who could come in and corrupt believers with false doctrine. Um, Paul warned um, and encouraged Timothy to preach the word, to be watchful, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist to fulfill his ministry. So today we're going to be discussing Paul's farewell and those who abandoned him. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and read uh, through verses 6 through 8. So um, 2 Timothy 4, and then we're going to go just 6 through 8, okay? And it says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So, in, uh, in verse 6, um, and I, I kind of broke stuff up so that, um, so that we were, could go verse by verse and, and chunk to the verses that made sense together, so, um, and I put them in there so it would be easier to follow. 
Um, so for verse 6, for I am being already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. So in verse 6, Paul prepares Timothy for his imminent death by using the metaphor of a drink offering. And so for those of us who don't know, the drink offering was the final offering of sacrifices under the Jewish law in many of their feasts. So in Leviticus 23, the Lord gave Moses directions for his feasts. Um, and in reference to the Feast of Tabernacles, we see in verses 37 and 38 that the Lord says, These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything on its day. Besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides the gifts, besides all your vows, besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. In, uh, in John MacArthur's study Bible, um, he states, Paul saw his coming death as his final offering to God in a life that had already been full of sacrifices to him. And so this, this was his way of telling them, hey, I'm coming to the end, and, and that and I didn't put it in there, but the word, um, that word for departure is the Greek word analusos, which, mean, which actually is meaning like to loosen. And because Paul was a tent maker, he really, he, he saw his life as, okay, this is the end. Things are coming down and wrapping things up, right? And so it was, it was, to me, it was just beautiful, a beautiful metaphor that he would use that term to, you know, in association with just bringing together, I'm a tent maker, the tabernacle, the drink of offering, and all of those things coming together just to say, I'm coming to the end. And, and, but he was ready, right? He was ready for that. Um, in uh, verse 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So verse 7 contains several metaphors for a life well spent serving the Lord. Paul had given his life fully to serving the Lord until his very last breath. He certainly did fight the good fight, considering he had been through some very difficult trials and tribulations in his ministry. He tells us in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 24 through 28. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbery, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. And how many of us would not have stopped, stopped after the first lashing, right? Hey, I, I've been beaten, maybe, I, maybe I, this is too much for me, right? Um, but not Paul, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Paul continued on like a runner who paces himself with his eye on the finish line. He pushed on until the very last trial and kept the faith. A beautiful example of what it means to live for Christ. He knew what was coming, but, it, he, but he did not waver because he knew what was on the other side of the suffering in this life. And we all have our stories, right? We all have our struggles. We all have our pains. We all have our aches and pains as we get older, right? Um, but despite all of that, you know, we push on. And it's a blessing. It's a blessing to see you ladies come from week to week, pushing on, continuing in the faith. And for Paul, I mean, he, you know, our, our little aches and pains are no comparison to the sufferings that he went through or the sufferings of Jesus but we push through because we know what's on the other side, right? We love the Lord and we know we know we have the hope of heaven and that's what, we're, that's what we have and that's where we're going. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, 
which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. That's verse 8. So here in verse 8, Paul endured being poured out through the trials and tribulations because he had the hope of heaven. His eyes were set on the life to come, not the present suffering. In verse 8, Paul continues his metaphor and transitions to our final prize at the end of our race called life. Like athletes who competed in the Roman arenas, he was looking forward to his crown, but um, but one made of, not one made of garland like those given to military officers and or athletes, but one of righteousness. However, this is not a crown of righteousness grounded in his own efforts or his own works or sufferings or any of the work that he did. This is a crown resting on the righteousness of Christ. Um, MacArthur in, in that study Bible says, the context here seems to indicate that the crown represents eternal righteousness. Believers receive the imputed righteousness of Christ's justification at salvation. The Holy Spirit's the Holy Spirit works practical righteousness, sanctification, in the believer through his lifetime of struggle with sin, but only when the struggle is complete will the Christian receive Christ's righteousness perfected in him, glorification, when he enters heaven. But this crown isn't just for the best runner or the strongest fighter. It is for all who have lived, loved Christ's appearing. And that's us, right? So that crown of righteousness is for us also. And so we're blessed by that and we're thankful for that. Um, so let's go on to verses 9 through 12. So in verse 9. Sorry, my both bifocals don't always work the way they should. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Christians for Galatia, uh, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. All right. So this section is titled The Abandoned Apostle. So despite all of his physical trials and sufferings at the hands of unbelievers, um, Paul had to face one of his final trials, which was being abandoned by those he called friends and fellow believers. Um, his heart was for the Lord's people, so this final trial must have cut just as deeply as the physical ones. This also brings to light some of the reasons for his warnings to Timothy, his close and dear faith son in the faith. So... Let's look at some of those, um, and I, I labeled this the section for this part, Paul's updates and requests, because at the end of every letter, Paul kind of gives an update of, you know, so-and-so says hi, and this is what happened, and here's where they are, this is how they're doing, just on, on different people that, that, that they knew each other, right, um, friends? So um, this is just kind of Paul going back to that, that style and saying, hey, here's, here's where we are with, with the people that we know, right? Um, and so in verse 9, he says, um, and I grouped 9 and 13 together. Um, um, and when you, when you read through, you'll understand. To come to me quickly, bring the cloak that I have left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. parchments. So in verses 9 and 13, those, those topics are, are closely related, right? We're able to see the close relationship that Paul and Timothy have. Paul knows how far Ephesus is from Rome and that it would take a couple of weeks to arrive. So Orbis, the Stanford Geospatial Network model of the Roman world, calculates that the fastest journey from Ephesus to Rome in July takes 16.2 days, covering 1,906 kilometers. So if that makes no sense to you, I put a map at the very end. So you, if you want to look at the, at the map, you can see the map. And that bottom map shows you how far it would be. Okay, 
So when he says, come quickly, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty far, right? Six, two weeks of travel. So when Paul says, come quickly, um, it's not it's not because he, he knew that it that his it was because he knew his departure or death was near and wanted to see his closest friend and son in the faith before his death, in addition to the fact that he was abandoned by Demas in verse ten, all right? And some of the others. So you can see, right? He says come quickly, but he's not saying it like like, you know, like, oh you 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 could be here tomorrow. It's gonna take him two weeks to come quickly, okay? And, and so uh, in verse 13, we see that closeness again. We see the trust that Paul has in Timothy. He charges him with a few little things, right? His little requests. He charges him with taking a short three-day tour to Alexandria Troas, just north of Ephesus, to pick up a cloak, his books, and parchments. So when he says, hey, can you stop by? It's not like, hey, can you stop at a neighbor's house? It was a three-day travel north to pick up those items, okay? And so you can see just how close they were because, you know, this is the type of request only close friends would ask of each other, right? I'm asking you to go out of the way. I know it's hard, but, you know, please, I, I love you, and please come come get those things for me because I, I really need them. And, and I just, I thought that was... I, I don't know, I just thought that was so beautiful that that Timothy just loved Paul so much, you know, like a father that, yes, Dad, whatever you need, I'll go I'll go do it, right? How many of us wouldn't do anything for, for our parents? How many of us wouldn't do anything for, for our brothers and sisters, right? And they have that close relationship, that, that Timothy was willing to do that for him in, in these little requests, right? Um, in verse 10. So here I grouped verse 10, 14, and 15. I grouped those together because those have some common ideas, okay? Um, so verse 10. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Gresham's for Galatia, and Titus for Dalmatia. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him for he has greatly resisted our words. So now this was, um, this, this was the, I guess the, the tough part, right? To read, um, to read just, um, I don't, just that betrayal, right? To see it and to know that it happened to Paul as well. You know, not just Jesus, but also to Paul. And so here in verses 10, 14, and 15, um, we see the examples of believers that Paul trusted, but who betrayed his trust and walked away from the faith. Um, Demas had been with Paul throughout much of his travels in the ministry. He was a trusted friend and companion, along with several others, as we see in um, Colossians 4.14. So um, Colossians 4.14 says, Luke the beloved physician and Demas greet you, and and in Philemon, one twenty three through twenty four, we see. Epaphras, um, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, um, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers, and so you see there, right? Demas is is listed among the his fellow laborers, right? Um, and so it's sad to think that in the last few days of Paul, of the life of Paul, Paul experienced the loss of trusted friends through abandonment. Um, you know, we've we've lost friend. We friendship changes, right? Friendship experiences seasons, but when when it's not just that they're leaving you for, you know, because they had they got another job or something like that happened. But they're leaving because they're leaving the faith. That hurts deeply, because that means there's a parting that that can never be mended, right? Because they're no longer in Christ, and so if they're no longer in Christ, then we can no longer be together. And that that was I I sorry I get emotional. 
you know, to me, that was like, you know, that had to be painful. You know, that it's not just that, um, okay, they left Jesus. Well, too bad, so sad. I'll see you later. But we can no longer, you know, we don't, we can no longer have the same closeness because, you know, even if I still talk to you or even if we're still friends, you know, we can't, we can't have that, the closeness that we once had because we were believers in Jesus Christ and we had the hope of heaven together. And so that made me sad to think, to think about, about that um, and that kind of betrayal that he faced. I'm sorry, I do really get emotional. I wasn't kidding. <laughs> um, so they were his fellow laborers, right? And it's sad to think that in the last day, in the in those last few days of Paul, Paul experienced the loss of those trusted friends through through abandonment. Um, MacArthur writes, Demas was a fair weather disciple who had never counted the cost of genuine commitment to Christ. But Paul, like Christ, did not let anything stop him from preaching the word. Despite that pain, despite that hurt, it doesn't matter because what matters is not the ones who have left, but the ones who remain. And I have to love them and I have to preach to them and I have to teach them God's word because that's what matters, right? Mm -hmm. So we see a further example of Paul's faith and determination to preach the gospel through his experience with Alexander in verses 14 and 15. So Alexander opposed Paul's teachings and likely spread his own false doctrine. He may have been instrumental in Paul's arrest and may even have borne false witness against him. Alexander may have been the reason that Paul was so emphatic in his warnings against that false doctrine. And so now we start to see a little bit clearer, right? And how he's, he's experienced these things, he's seen these things, and so now he's warning others. Look, this is what could happen. You need to be careful, right? And so, but, but he's even more specific with warning Timothy about Alexander. But I love how Paul doesn't say, doesn't complain about Alexander. He doesn't put Alexander down. He doesn't say, oh, look at what he did to me. He just says, just be careful, right? He says, he's done me much harm, and he says, be careful. We see a further example of Paul's, oh, uh, sorry, next, next paragraph. So how many of us would have backed down after facing such a stark opposition, right? but not Paul. And how many of us would have grown angry and bitter, but not Paul? He says, may the Lord repay him. Paul placed vengeance in God's hands. I think this is kind of a pay me now or pay me later, right? Pay God now or pay God later situation. But Alexander would eventually pay because he, because he would still, he still had to face, he still has to face the judge, right? Ultimately. Um, which is Jesus Christ, right? He still has to face the Lord. And so we see that. Sorry, my eyes are... are, are. So Paul remains faithful in his, in his teachings in Romans. So this reflects what he taught in Romans, right? He says these things about, about Alexander. But it's also reflected in Romans, so we can see that consistency in his faith, right? So Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the, says the Lord. In accordance with God's word in Deuteronomy 32, 35, Vengeance is mine and recompense, their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. It is comforting to know that we don't have to carry the pain from our past because of unforgiveness. We serve a mighty God who will judge everyone at the end, including ourselves, right? Let him who has a better perspective, the Lord, make the final judgment rather than carrying bitterness and resentment in our hearts over past events that we cannot change. Let him take care of it. You just continue and preach the word, right? You just continue in the faith. All right.
So now we're going to go back to verses 11 and 12. So um, Paul says, can somebody get me a tissue, please? I meant to, to have a box ready. <laughs> okay, so verse 11 says, um, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. So in stark contrast to Demas and Alexander, there were those who remained faithful to Jesus, to Paul, and to the ministry. Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, was Paul's friend and personal physician. Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, at one point abandoned Paul in Pamphylia and caused division between Mark's cousin Barnabas and Paul in Acts 15, um, 36 through 39. We can see the, the description of the event. Okay. So, uh, then, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now back go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take them, take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they departed from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. So we see that separation, right? So, okay, there was a contention. They, they separated. Um, we don't know the reason why Mark wanted to leave, but he did. And so um, it happens, right? It happens. You know, sometimes there's disagreements. We're, we're all, um, how can I say this? We're all believers, but we're all sinners too, right? And so we're, we all have our weaknesses. We all have our things that we're working on. And so sometimes that happens, you know, we, we bump heads, there's contentions, there's disagreements, um, but we can't leave it at that, right? There has to be forgiveness, there has to be reconciliation, because that's, that's, that's what our life is. We're reconciling our lives um, so that we can get closer to God, right? At some point, we're, we're going to face the Lord, and as we're going, and the Lord is allowing us to, to, um, to grow in the faith, and to, um, to be able to know that as we are growing and, and the Lord is showing us, hey, this is a weakness that you need to work on now, right? That we're, we're open mm -hmm. to being humble and being able to work on that, right? And accept it, accept that correction. Because sometimes we don't always accept the correction, right? The Lord shows us and we're like, right? No, Lord. <laughs> I, I, it's not me. It's not me, right? But, um, but you know, when he shows us, we have to be humble because he's going to continue, and it's going to continue, and we're going to face the same trial over and over until we, we, we humble ourselves and say, yes, Lord, you're right, and then, and then handle it the way that the Lord wants us, right? And so at some point, Mark was restored and became a trusted and dependable friend to Paul, exemplifying forgiveness, restoration, and redemption. And so, yes, there was a contention at some point, but there was also forgiveness. There was also restoration. They were able to work it out, and he became a trusted friend. And so, yes, you know, right now, if somebody's like, you know, getting on your last nerve, and you're like, oh, Lord, why? You know, I'll, have that love and forgiveness for them because you don't know what God's going to do with them. You know, you, I mean, look at Mark wrote the gospel of Mark, right? Mm -hmm. Look at that. And so you don't know what the Lord is doing. And so if, you know, if, if you, if there's somebody like that right now in your life, pray for them and, and ask the Lord to show you what, what he wants you to learn and how you can, how you can get beyond that, right? How you can have that restoration and that forgiveness with another believer, right? All right, so then um, we come to our final verse, verse 16. Um, At my first defense, 
No one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. So just because you are doing the Lord's work doesn't mean that people will follow you. Sometimes other believers may walk away uh, from you because they aren't ready for the sacrifice and dedication that the work entails. Um, they may be afraid or simply not ready. We don't know, right? Even Jesus experienced this type of betrayal when all the disciples denied him after he was arrested. But Paul didn't hold it against him, and he prayed that the Lord wouldn't either. I pray that we have the same heart towards those who hurt or abandon us so that we may finish our race strong in the faith and confident in the hope of heaven. That we have that strength and that trust that we're going to receive that crown of righteousness because we have been obedient to what the Lord has called us, right? Amen. So I leave you with the final Mark eleven twenty-five. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. So I'm gonna, let's go ahead and close in prayer, and then you guys can pass. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for just this time. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you uh, have spoken to our hearts, and we pray, Lord, that whatever you have spoken to us, that we would go out and that we would act on that thing, Lord God, that you have that you have spoken to our hearts, and that we would leave here changed, and that we would be obedient to your word.